so tonight uh, we are excited to uh, welcome Dr. Danielle Ignace, uh, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences at the University of British Columbia. Uh, she'll be talking about transitioning ecosystems, uh, foundation species loss due to hemlock woolly adelgid effects, uh, ecosystem function. Uh, Dr. Ignace is a plant ecophysiologist and ecosystem, ecosystem scientist uh, based at the University of British Columbia, where she is an assistant professor of indigenous natural sciences uh, in the Department of uh, Forest and Conservation Sciences. Uh, Dr. Ignace is also a research associate at Harvard Forest here in Massachusetts, uh, where she's involved in projects working with indigenous communities, uh, in addition to her research on forest ecosystems. Um, prior to starting her position at the University of British Columbia, she was also a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences uh, here at Smith College, where I'm based. Um, so we've been colleagues for many years and good friends. Um, in terms of her background, uh, Dr. Ignace received her Bachelor of Science degree uh, in Zoology and Environmental Studies from the University of Wisconsin, uh, and then undertook graduate studies at the University of Arizona, where she received her Master's degree and PhD uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, her research on plant ecophysiology, uh, invasion biology, and ecosystem science um, has taken her from uh, major research projects in the field in the Chihuahuan Desert of the, the southwestern US, um, all the way to New England, uh, where she's worked on forest ecosystems uh, with a focus on uh, hemlock decline. Uh, and she's now launching new research in the Pacific Northwest um, where she's based at the University of British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Ignace has published her research in a wide range of journals, uh, botanical and ecological journals from the New Phytologist in Ecology and Ecologia uh, to Ecosphere and Northeastern Naturalist. Um, we're really delighted to have Danielle uh, join us this evening to talk about her research um, in the Northeast uh, focused on hemlock ecosystems and the major uh, transitions in store for these systems um, as they are affected by hemlock woolly adelgid and other uh, invasive pests. And it's uh, just sort of a delight to have uh, Danielle join us tonight, sort of the wonder of Zoom and remote meetings, having her coming in to us from uh, Vancouver and British Columbia. So uh, please join me in welcoming Danielle. Um, and we're all looking forward to hearing about the, the research. Well, it's so wonderful to be here virtually to, to talk to you all about uh, a system that I've been working on, in particular with Jesse Bellamere uh, during my time in Massachusetts. And um, I'm really grateful that uh, I have this wonderful invitation to talk to you all about that. And I do miss uh, working with and talking science with Jesse and as well as others, uh, familiar names I see uh, on the participation list. So hello, and then please at the end, I'd uh, love to see uh, your wonderful faces because uh, it's been a while since uh, I've seen yours uh, during pandemic times. So yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I am joining you today from the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and uh, Suela tooth people was in what is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia. So it was quite the move. We arrived uh, in July. So we drove from Western Massachusetts to Vancouver in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so it's been quite the transition. Um, it's going well. Um, and it's, it's really fun to still talk about uh, Eastern hemlocks. And I'll give you the broad overview highlights of the work that I've done with Jesse. And it also includes uh, some undergrads that we worked with over the years um, while we worked together at Smith College. Um, but I also want to invite you to think about some questions along the way. There are some data that we simply don't have time to talk about. Um, and, I, and I guess that's why the Q&A session will be so great. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions later through email. So you can reach me by uh, via Twitter. You can check out my YouTube channel. Um, you can uh, also check out the other projects that I'm not talking about today that are described on my webpage at ignacelab.com. Okay. Right, so I always feel nowadays that I, it's important to talk a little bit about myself and uh, cultural background and cultural identity. Uh, so I'm an enrolled member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And if you're not familiar, 
with the Coeur d'Alene tribe, it's in Northern Idaho. So that's where my, my grandpa was until, until he passed. That's him on the bottom left on the screen there. And that's where my dad grew up. And on my mother's side, I am a nominee and that is in Northern Wisconsin. And she passed in, in the past couple of years as well. But as a whole, um, you know, my siblings and I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And as I guess, as a family, as a group, as a unit, we view ourselves as um, you know, Coeur d'Alene and Menominee. And I grew up in this, in this family um, with parents devoted to enhancing healthcare for Native Americans in urban settings, in particular, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You can see on the bottom right there is a picture of, um, of the Gerald L. Ignace Indian Health Clinic, which is in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, my dad and my brother spent many years in the Indian Health Service um, uh, trying to enhance healthcare for Native Americans. Um, and so that's that was a big part of, um, I guess, being raised in Milwaukee and, and kind of thinking how I might contribute to that legacy. And on my, my mom's activities were really big in the Native American arts. And so I do have kind of this interesting artistic background and, and interests that stick with me today, especially as it relates to art and science and how those two can be combined um, to help uh, make science more accessible to the general public. Okay. All right, so, and just another little fun snippet here. Uh, so that's my dad from a long time ago, uh, early days when he became a physician. And I think uh, what's really interesting is that he wasn't always interested in being a physician. He actually started out in his days in Northern Idaho on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation thinking that he would be um, a forest manager, a forest ecologist. And so he really wanted to protect the beautiful Douglas fir forest in the area and um, joined the smoke jumpers. So he would jump out of an airplane and then fight wildfires on the ground. Um, and as you can imagine how grueling that is, um, wasn't able to maintain his weight. And uh, so thus ended his days as a smoke jumper. Um, but of course still wanted to do other things related to science. And in this case, he went on to become a, a physician, which is a fun kind of full circle moment for me, having um, grown up thinking I would be a physician. And then eventually through a series of research experiences uh, in undergrad years while I was in Madison, um, decided that no, plants was it for me. I love plants, I love mountains and looking at these big landscapes. And I knew that's what I needed to work on for my career. Um, but we had a, a really fun kind of, um, I guess, conversation about it uh, before I moved to uh, uh, British Columbia. And he, he said, well, if I had to go back and do it again, I guess I, I would have I would have picked uh, you know, forest ecology. So um, here I am <laughs> and uh, working on forest ecology. And as it turns out, some of my new research will be working on the impacts of wildfires in British Columbia. So that's me um, personally and, and thinking about my cultural identity, which is so important, especially as Jesse mentioned in the introduction, how now I think about how can I take all this, like this research that I do in the framework that I use and think about a bigger picture, society, uh, communities of color and especially indigenous communities, whether it's in Massachusetts, which I have been working on in the past year, or uh, the new communities that I, be, that I will be working with in Vancouver, British Columbia. So I do have this one big question, how does global change um, impact ecosystem function? And of course, it can be a lot of different global change factors. I think about uh, invasives, which include both plants and pests. I'm um, starting to think about pathogens and, and fire as well, as I mentioned, as well as dramatic changes in climate. So of course, these can act solely or interact to create big changes um, at the ecosystem level. And ecosystems in transition, um, I, I tend to view that as ecosystems kind of undergoing big changes or big disturbances. In this case, an invasion, and perhaps we lose a lot of diversity or abundance of native species. That is the kind of ecosystem uh, or transition that I, that I think about. And I try to measure as much as I possibly can in these systems. Uh, my training is based in this ecophysiology world where I think a lot about fluxes of gases, in particular CO2. So I try to um, incorporate measurements or estimates of 
photosynthetic rate, so how much carbon is coming from the atmosphere and being fixed in these ecosystems, as well as how much CO2 is being respired back out to the atmosphere. And lots of things can impact those, those types of processes. Uh, I do think uh, below ground quite a bit um, or at the forest floor. And so I do think about fungal diversity, bacterial diversity and abundances and how those can impact soil organic layers as well as the cycling of nutrients in the system. And of course, there is a, a big above ground component. We see all this biomass in, in, um, in these, these forest ecosystems, and, but as well, we have to think about the leaf litter that falls down to the forest floor and how that kind of gets churned through the below ground component. So I try to measure as much of this as I can and try to realize what is the net ecosystem exchange, uh, the overall balance of CO2 being um, fixed and in going into the system via photosynthesis and how much gets lost to the atmosphere via respiration. And of course, when we think about this balance of these processes, that naturally leads us to think about what's happening overall. If we are losing more CO2 to the atmosphere, likely because respiration is higher than the amount of CO2 that gets fixed during photosynthesis, then we have an ecosystem that is essentially turning into a source for CO2 and therefore will contribute more to global warming and therefore more to climate change. And of course the reverse is true if we have more photosynthesis and capturing that CO2, then the ecosystem becomes a sink. So these, this is the overall framework uh, in which I work with and of course, this, as Jesse mentioned, I've worked in a lot of different ecosystems and, and working now in the Pacific Northwest. So I, I take this framework and these questions with me. And of course, we're all here to talk about uh, Eastern hemlocks, the loss of a really important foundation species in the Eastern United States. And it's really a, a gorgeous uh, species. It has, why is it a foundation species? It has like so many unique uh, properties and therefore creates a unique um, uh, environment in, in these systems. So you can see on the right here, they, even though there might be a small gap in the canopy, overall, it is so unique in how dense the canopy is, how very little light can actually get through that canopy. I've seen estimates as low as 1% of the light can actually move through the canopy and reach the forest floor. So overall, it's really shady. It creates a cooler environment. And as you can see that there's not much on the forest floor there. And so it's super unique in that it has this uh, forest floor that's very acidic uh, in part to be due to the composition of the needles having polyphenolic compounds that don't break down very easily. And because of that, we can get this buildup of the organic layer in the soil. And as in addition, a kind of slow turnover and decomposition that would lead to uh, less nutrients. And here's the distribution of eastern hemlock. As you can see, it's quite uh, uh, widespread from the south, uh, if you think about the area of Georgia, and then uh, going into the uh, United, uh, north, northeastern United States and Canada, and kind of creeps in there to the Midwest as well. There are also some really unique uh, Native American uses of eastern hemlocks. If we think about this, um, you know, historically, there's been uses for treating ailments such as uh, colds and fevers and soreness. And if we think about the plant anatomy, the bark was used to make dye. You could have tea with this. I've never, I've never had tea with the Eastern hemlocks or you could use the cambium for, uh, as the base for breads and soups. And actually this is really similar to Western hemlock species that are here in the Pacific Northwest. And here's a slide that uh, courtesy of Jesse uh, from back in the day and uh, that shows how we can have a, a pest such as the hemlock woolly adulged that really was, um, you know, it ended up here, transported here, likely before, well before the 1950s. But uh, and around the 1950s is when we really like, recognized it in Virginia. And so in this case, um, the hemlock woolly adulged associated with Japanese hemlock, um, that was a, quite the okay uh, relationship, you know, having this co evolution. And therefore, it wasn't uh, doing so much harm to the Japanese hemlock. Of course, once the woolly adulted was introduced to the United States, it quickly spread uh, south and north 
And then we have a situation where Eastern hemlocks did not have any host resistance to it. So we find ourselves in a situation for decades where they have a, a quick die off because of this uh, pest. And here's a picture on the left that shows kind of your, your telltale sign that you have uh, hemlock lily adulgids present on the hemlock. If you see these small kind of cotton balls, these white tufts um, with egg sacs, um, they're at the base of the needles. Um, so if you just flip over your branch and take a look and you see that, then you know that you're deep into um, hemlock lily adulgid um, at pest invasion. So in this, in this graph here, you can see the counties, and this is even outdated at this point, it's quickly spreading, especially as we have to deal with warmer temperatures during the winter. Um, it's getting pretty well known at this point that if we have warmer winters, that actually helps uh, the adulted survive better. And because they can't really withstand uh, temperatures below zero degrees very well, or I should say Fahrenheit. So uh, below zero Fahrenheit, they, they don't do so well. Um, so in this case, when we have more uh, warm winters, well, that actually leads us to a situation where we're going to have really high abundances of the woolly adulted. It is not the only pest though. If we take a look at this, this these images are beautiful, um, even though slightly gruesome from uh, the Center for Microscopy and Imaging at Smith College. Um, you can't really see the white tufts necessarily on this picture at the base of the needles. But if you look at the rest of the needles, you can see these scales, the elongate hemlock scale, which are quite common. Uh, and we, other scales are on other plants. So you might've seen these before. And these are quite large, right? They take over quite a bit of the leaf area on, on the Eastern hemlock. So these are actually present in really high abundances in addition to the woolly adulgent. And this is something I think is really fascinating research. We, we definitely need people to think about this interaction that's happening here. We don't really know why uh, the Eastern hemlock, despite having such a strong reaction to the woolly adulgid, does not have a, as strong of a reaction to the high abundance of the elongate hemlock scale. So we don't know if there's something, an uh, interaction here, and maybe there's not an interaction, but that's definitely something worth looking into in the future. So we tend to get these, uh, what we call hemlock graveyard sites, and this is fairly common. Um, as we know, in these systems, black birch trees uh, tend to be an associate in these ecosystems. And you can see in this image, all these old down Eastern hemlocks that have been decimated by, by the woolly adulgent. So what ends up happening, we have a completely new environment, right? We have a very open, sunny environment. In this case, black birch being an associate uh, in these systems, can come in and do quite well and flourish. And so we end up having this pretty standard transition where formerly um, East dominated uh, Eastern hemlock systems get converted to uh, deciduous black birch stands. So this creates a very unique transition because Eastern hemlocks are evergreen conifers and as I said, we have so many unique features of this foundation species, whereas black birch stands, that's going to be deciduous. So that is, there's going to have drastically different impacts on the environment as well as the ecosystem processes. And that's where I come in and, and some of some of my work with Jesse and students as well, and think about what are the impacts of this type of ecosystem and transition from hemlock to black birch. I'm trying to think about all the CO2 fluxes, the soil nutrient cycling, uh, what's happening in, this, in the soil with uh, microbial communities, and overall, is this going to be a source or sink uh, for CO2 once we make that transition? So this was done at the McLeish Field Station. Uh, it's over by Waitley. If you haven't been over that to that area, close to Smith is, uh, I, I would uh, guess, uh, what, 15, 20 minute drive from Smith College. So it's really close. And this area is beautiful. Um, it's a research site that is located on the land of the Pukumtuk people as well. So we have uh, what is known as an accidental experiment. There was a forest manager who, for whatever reason, and I, we still don't know, at least as far as I know, um, 
uh, why so there were some plots that were pretty uniform, but they were logged uh, at 30 plus years ago. Um, so in, in a sense, that seemed a little bit weird to have this happen. Uh, but at the same time, now it provides us with this amazing opportunity to have an accidental experiment that allows us to create a space for time substitution. So rather than us having to wait for a whole stand of eastern hemlocks to kind of fall over and die, or it, especially not having have, have us log and clear out areas ourselves, this allows us to essentially look into the future of what will happen when we lose eastern hemlocks and black birch starts to come in. So what we have at the McLeish Field Station are these 20 by 20 meter paired plots. Um, in this case, we have uh, now, because they're 30 plus years uh, old, we have what we call the young black birch stands. And these are paired with mature hemlock stands. And these hemlocks are anywhere between 85 to 100 years old. So we call those mature hemlocks. And then over time, we've added another site at McLeish as well. So they're not necessarily um, adding to this pair, but they are slightly off-site at McLeish. They are mature black birch stands, um, and these are also similarly aged as hemlocks, so they are around 85 to 100 years old. So at these sites, what have we looked at? One is uh, doing, like, including a bunch of students uh, and looking at the counts per leaf. And in this case, looking at Julianne Day, and we've done this sporadically, I think we need more pest counts. And there's some folks at Harvard Forest, and we've talked about having kind of a more uniform or standard way to, to have these pest counts, because we've noticed a few trends. And the first one is that I mentioned on, on those beautiful images before that the elongate hemlock scale is present in really high abundances all year long always higher than the hemlock woolly adult it. And this is what they also see at the other sites. But one thing we really need to build on is uh, including you know, year to year variation, you know, season to season, as well as thinking about, well, if we have a warmer winter or a colder winter, what does that do to the counts? So we really need to standardize this across the area a little bit more, but this is the main trend that we tend to see. And this is regardless of having old or newer foliage, the hemlock um, uh, scale is always in really high abundance. And let's, look, let's take a look at a um, uh, year of litter fall. As I mentioned that we are making this transition from uh, an evergreen conifer to a deciduous black birch. And if we just take a look at the leaf litter, then you can see hemlock in this mango colored here next to the young birch in the blue color. And as I mentioned that these are paired plots. And so of course we're gonna have some mixing, right? So litter was going to fall and likely kind of randomly fall into each of these paired plots. So we do have quite a bit of mix here uh, with regards to the litter. And as I mentioned, the mature birch stands are a little bit more off plots, uh, further away from these paired plots. And uh, luckily they are mostly um, uh, birch as we see in, in the, litter, the litter fall count. So that's a good thing. And here's an example from the field. Um, uh, Jesse put these out in the field. These uh, the laundry basket, the trusty, trusty uh, laundry baskets out in the field. Uh, so we can collect all of that litter and get, get these estimates. And you can see um, just how different of, a, of an environment is, gets created because of such dramatic changes in that leaf litter. I also think a lot about carbon, as I mentioned, in this case, soil CO2 flux. So I have installed uh, permanent soil collars, which are basically thin PVC uh, soil collars that kind of go out in the field. If, if we were to go out there now, we'd have to brush away a bunch of the leaf litter and kind of dig around to find them. But they are pretty shallow, um, but they're, they're not really doing harm kind of being there. I think it, and it's also great to have them be semi-permanent so that I'm not disturbing the soil very much. So it's important to in install these soil collars and then let them rest in the soil and then return to these collars uh, every time I go out to measure and to the, uh, using this uh, handy machine, the Lycor 6400, it measures all kinds of different things. Um, it can measure photosynthetic rate. It has an attachment that I use to measure soil respiration. There's also the LI8100, which I've used in the past as well. 
Um, regardless of which one you pick, uh, for most of the data, I use the Lycor 6400, which is incredibly awkward and heavy. So I had to strap it to a metal um, uh, frame backpack as I hike in the woods. And of course, some of the terrain can be somewhat technical. So that's actually quite tiring by the end of the day when I'm finished with these measurements. And they all need to be done within a certain amount of time uh, and each day that I go out. And um, well, if I when I've gotten too tired or gotten injured, then I've, I've gotten my husband to help me out with some of these. Uh, he gets to carry the Lycor and, and also measure uh, soil, um, soil moisture and temperature out in the field. Okay, I'll, I won't get into the weeds of, of all the soil CO2 flux data, which is a lot. Um, I'll show you a representative year. In this case, this is 2017. And the color patterns uh, that existed for the leaf litter is the same here in which the hemlock is in kind of this mango yellow color and young birch is in blue. And on the top graph, we have the soil respiration. So the amount of CO2 being admitted to the atmosphere and I'm able to measure that on the forest floor. And if we look at the hemlock and the young birch, they're really similar, right? So even though we, we were starting to do these measurements right at the end of the spring or very early summer, that they really were quite similar. And then you see the steep increase uh, over time throughout the growing season. And they at some point reach some sort of peak at the peak of the growing season, and then they start to decline drastically. And you can see as you get into uh, the late, uh, late fall and, and winter time, uh, Julianne day of 325 or 330, at this point, there's not a lot of activity happening. And so they are, the values are super low. And it's actually quite difficult to get uh, a soil CO2 flux value because it takes so long to get the CO2 to build up in the chamber. So contrasting that with the red line, which is the mature birch stands, as you can see, it at times has double, maybe even triple the amount of soil CO2 in those stands relative to the hemlock and young birch. So what this is effectively saying, if we have this transition from hemlock to young birch and then you know, 80, 85 years plus into the future, we can see just how much CO2 gets lost to the atmosphere. And of course, like I said, when we get into the deep winter here, everything converges together. There's not a whole lot happening out there in terms of activity. So everything's really low and the same. And if we look at the bottom graph, that is water, um, uh, volumetric water content, which is an estimate of soil moisture. And kind of a, a different trend is happening here where we see hemlock stands and mature birch stands having very similar values. And that's because, as I mentioned, they're around the same age. So they have roughly the same amount of above ground biomass and therefore tend to use the same amount of water. So in this case, I'm not surprised that we see no differences between those sites. And contrast that with the young birch stands, which are you know, pretty young, 30 plus years old. Um, they have more water available in the soil because they don't have as much biomass and don't need uh, as much water to take up. So that's a good representative year. Of course, <clears throat> there has been times when we have droughts. And in this case, you know, we have this nice hump shaped graph here on the top left with the soil respiration. If we have a drought, actually we kind of see the opposite of that. And so generally in a normal year, if you, <laughs> however you want to describe a normal year of precipitation, this is what we will tend to see. Okay, so some overall trends here as hemlock forest transition to black birch forest. We know that uh, there's high leaf litter in the black birch forest, and we also have high soil CO2 flux. So why did this happen? Um, and this is where it's really fun to collaborate with people like Jesse Bellamere, and also we co-advise students on these projects. Um, Eliza uh, Fassler was one of them. She was so great in, I guess, really kind of getting dirty in this case in the field. Um, and we'll talk about some of her awesome research as we go through this section. So we can see uh, Jesse's hand holding uh, a small soil profile at one of the sites. And so this is soil organic layer um, estimates that we have for each the hemlock, the young birch, and the mature birch sites. And this is uh, in the units of grams per meter squared. 
And in this case, we have a simple yet really beautiful graph that shows a dramatic stepwise decline in that soil organic layer. So you can see it be really beautifully laid out here in that soil profile. Um, we just have so much of that or organic layer that builds up in the hemlock system, again, because of the composition of the needles and they don't break down very easily. So, and that's a good thing. And that's because um, as we will see the amount of carbon that can possibly go into that amount of the soil organic layer is good for carbon storage. So over time, if we're transitioning to uh, mature birch stands, we lose out on a lot of soil organic layer. So why might this be happening? Um, so one way we can get, get to that or answer that question would be to look at the carbon versus nitrogen that we see in that soil organic layer. In this case, we were able to take a subsample of that organic layer, process it and actually send it to Cornell. There's a there's an isotope lab there that uh, can estimate carbon and nitrogen for us. So that's a really fabulous resource that, that Smith uh, or that region had. If, if you don't have the equipment at Smith, you can send it elsewhere. And in this case, we see something similar as along with the loss of that organic soil layer, we see a loss of the carbon. So we tend to look at this in ratios and you know, ratios are sometimes hard to kind of grasp in terms of what's happening in this case, what this means is like we're losing out on that carbon and we have this interesting you know, transition of, of nutrients that can get released. And this kind of breaks it apart even more um, because you saw in an earlier image with the laundry baskets, just how much leaf litter can be um, dropped into those laundry baskets. Well, it'd be easy to think, well, is it just the amount of leaf litter that falls to the ground and does that mean how much is, is impacting those soil organic layer carbon to nitrogen ratios? In this case, we looked directly at the leaf litter and got the same carbon to nitrogen ratios. And in this case, we really grouped this together. So birch is shown in purple and the hemlock again in the, the mango yellow. So regardless of age, the birch um, always had lower carbon uh, values and then they always had higher nitrogen values. And so when we look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio, you, you can see on the right that the hemlock has more carbon of that leaf litter. Therefore, when it falls to the ground, that enhances the carbon that's in the soil organic layer. So we definitely have this direct um, comparison of that it's not the amount of leaf litter that falls to the ground, it's the quality of the leaf litter that enters the forest floor. Okay, so what does this mean as we kind of build on this data set? So as, as Eastern hemlocks transition to black birch, then again, we have this high leaf litter, we have high soil CO2 flux, it's the carbon to nitrogen ratios of that leaf litter that directly impact um, the carbon and nitrogen values of the soil organic layer. We know that it gets drastically depleted once it becomes a black birch forest stand. And because we have higher um, turnover ability, because the black birch uh, leaves uh, can decompose much easier than the needles of the Eastern hemlocks, we have faster nutrient cycling happening here. And there are different ways to kind of answer that question, um, which we didn't do, but overall you can see that even looking at carbon to nitrogen ratios that we have a really good indication of what's happening with the nutrient cycling. So because I, I mentioned that we have soil organic layer in grams per meter squared, that's a really useful, it seems rather simple, but it was an incredibly useful tool when Jesse came to me and said, you know, we could do some back of the hand calculations here. And now that we know um, the soil organic layer mass and per meter squared, so per area, well, and we know the percent carbon of that soil organic layer, might we be able to extrapolate and do some back of the hand calculations to what this means on a larger scale? And of course the answer is yes. And actually this is a really fun exercise that we have our students do in class. And it's always fun to see them work it out and they always get the same numbers, <laughs> luckily, right? So we, we weren't wrong. Uh, the students back up our estimates when we give them this exercise, which really is dramatic. So when we have this transition, it amounts to an incredible, um, percent decline in the soil organic layer of carbon storage 
which amounts to a four and a half tons of carbon per hectare. So if we lose eastern hemlocks, that is in, in a pretty good estimate of how much carbon we stand to lose. So that's uh, kind of devastating and quite dramatic. And of course, we have all these processes happening, and a lot of it happening at the forest floor or below ground. And what's really neat here is that there's this whole you know, microbial community and activity that we haven't even addressed yet. And because we know that there are dramatic changes in the soil, and we also know because Eastern hemlocks create such a special environment where the needles help to create a more acidic soil uh, environment, then we can make some pretty good guesses that, that might have dramatic impacts to the forest floor, fungal and bacterial communities. So again, this brings in students, wonderful students like Eliza Fassler, who really worked hard to get at bi-weekly uh, macrofungal community estimates. So doing bi-weekly surveys at these sites. And you can see here, I have so many pictures of this and, and maybe you all do too, when we have just that really special summertime precipitation and, and you know, the right temperature, we get this beautiful display of uh, the fungal communities. And, and so it's fun to take pictures when that happens every year. And yeah, maybe it doesn't, um, but hopefully it does, right? Because this is so beautiful. And what she was able to do through these surveys was make uh, really uh, great uh, morpho species uh, characterizations of what we're seeing at each site. Um, and this is uh, quite a bit of work and what, uh, what you can do, and we realize this is, looking at morpho species and that if we had a different kind of toolkit that we might have slightly different estimates of the number of species, but this served us pretty well in, in, this, in this instance. And what Eliza did in doing all these counts and surveys, looked at all the characteristics that you possibly could, in this case, uh, looking at mature fruiting bodies the, and, and making characteristics, uh, descriptions of the cap color, texture, uh, site characteristics and made spore prints. So these are all preserved and these images have been saved as well. So forever, any reason we needed to go back and, and look at this and kind of uh, think about it again, um, those are available. So I don't have time to um, go over all of that data, but I can tell you that at first we were a little bit uh, maybe uh, surprised or maybe even slightly disappointed. As I mentioned, we thought that there would be really big differences in the fungal community in these, in these sites. And so we thought that we would find drastically different number of species um, across the sites and over time. And what ended up happening, we really didn't see a change in the number of species or the number of morpho species in this case in the way we characterize them. And you can see on the graphs on the right, just over time through the sampling dates that they overlap quite a bit. We didn't really see those differences. Um, but when we really looked at the data a little bit more carefully, and uh, sorry, there's a white bar here on the graph, um, accidentally ended up there, but you can still see the overall trend on the left. When we made comparisons between the hemlock and the young birch, well, we have, again, pretty similar number of morpho species occurring here. But when we really had um, an in-depth ordination analysis on the data, we found something really interesting, which was that in the hemlock sites, if we had uh, one of the paired plots and then went to the next paired plot and the next and so on, we found that each one of those would have a unique combination of the macrofungal species. So it was quite unique in that each subplot would be so different from the next. But if you looked at the young birch subplots, well, actually, they were quite similar. And so what ended up happening um, when we looked at the data is that they basically become homogenized. You lose out in some of the rare species if you make that transition from hemlock to young birch. So at least we found something really, really interesting there. It might not have been number of species, but the combination of species is what's so important here in that we lose out on rare species. And some students are also involved in collecting 
uh, soil samples, uh, in particular at the soil organic layer, in order to get some sort of estimate of bacterial abundance. Again, this doesn't show bacterial uh, you know, species diversity or their functionality. I wish we had the toolkit to do that. If anyone wants to collaborate on that, I would love for that data set to become a reality. But this is a good estimate. If we looked at colony forming units, it's actually um, really interesting when you take these samples because obviously you can have such high bacterial abundance. So we had to do a dilution series in order to get it to some, I guess, countable or manageable level of bacteria so we could actually make counts. As you can see on the, on the y-axis, the numbers are quite high. So, uh, but there are still differences between the two sites. If we look on the left in 2015, that overall in June and July, so as we are going through the growing season, that there's more bacteria abundance in the hemlock site. And then suddenly we have this dramatic increase in October, and suddenly the bacterial abundance in the young birch stands is dramatically much higher than what we see in the hemlock. And this, we're not entirely sure why this is. One good guess would be that because of that amount of leaf litter that falls to the ground, enhances the bacterial abundance. But again, that's something that we would need to look into in the future. And if we look at 2016, we see a very similar trend here with just a couple of sampling dates that again, we have this shift from um, higher abundance in the, in the hemlock sites during the growing season. But once we get to the fall, we have a lot of leaf liver, litter in the black birch sands, it's much higher there. So again, adding to this diagram, what's happening? As we make the transition to black birch forests, we have higher leaf litter, higher soil CO2 flu uh, flux, and we have a dramatic decrease in the soil organic layer, faster nutrient cycling. Um, we also have a loss of some of the rare uh, macrofungal species. And we also have this interesting switch of bacterial abundance activity uh, from the summer to the fall. So all together, this is, this is quite a dramatic shift. And I feel like there's so much more that we could do to think about um, you know, what, what else could be included in here to help us understand what's happening. Um, I don't have time to go through how exactly some of my other research has um, exemplified or supported the idea that a warming climate could exacerbate these differences. If you want to look at my PLOS One paper from 2019, this goes through a series of looking at how um, a warming climate could impact the soil respiration by looking at temperature sensitivities of the soil respiration estimates. Um, and it's not as dramatic as, as we you think it might be when you read the paper, but the data does support that if we have more, more and more warming, that we could have exacerbated differences in the soil CO2 flux. So one big question that I always get um, is, is it possible to do something about this? Is mitigation possible? And of course, you know, this is not exactly a new uh, invasion, right? Uh, we've been thinking about this for decades and it's certainly seen the dramatic impacts, at least in Massachusetts, for quite a while, the fast die off in some areas. Um, what's interesting is that in the past, folks have done salvage logging. And of course, that was be becoming an issue as we, if you salvage logged areas in order to stop the spread of the Willie Adulted. Well, of course you lose out on healthy or perhaps even individuals that perhaps one day would have host resistance to the woolly adulted. So um, using chemicals in addition is expensive is, and also not ideal in these types of systems. So is mitigation possible? Well, there's a group, um, this is not my work. There's a really great article that was published recently in GRIST looking at all the different uh, groups that have been working on Eastern Hemlocks. It includes folks from Harvard Forest and this group up in New York. And so New York has really, really seen uh, dramatic uh, woolly adult numbers and impacts on the Eastern Hemlocks. And for a while I've been thinking about, is there some way to have a biological control on the woolly adult? So some of this work started with looking at the natural predator black beetle and Black beetle as a natural predator is actually in my neck of the woods now and helps to keep those woolly adulted uh, numbers down. 
But what ended up happening was it was good to a point in that because the Willia Delgit has these two really unique uh, generations that happen in winter and spring, that it just couldn't keep up with the numbers, the abundance of the Willia Delgits. So it worked kind of. <laughs> and so, but what ended up happening several years ago, um, the group in the Pacific Northwest thought, well, there's also this other natural predator that is specific to the Willia Delgit, and that is the silver fly. And so this group, the Whitmore Lab at Cornell, has started this New York State Hemlock Initiative and really doing a fantastic job in releasing a huge amount of these silver flies along with the black beetles at this point getting into 33 states. And I, it might take us a while to see the big impacts of this, but I think this is a good, a good thing and, and maybe a way to be hopeful we, like, we can't get those Eastern hemlocks back that we've lost, but it, maybe this is a good way. At least I'm gonna hold some hope that this is a way to help mitigate further spread. So that's important. And especially in the case, if we continue to see warmer and warmer winters, uh, which are, I guess, in a sense, help the survival of Willie Adelgid. So if we have some way to kind of deal with both of those generations, then this will be a big help in that. Still lots of work to be done here as well. You know, it, even though I painted this picture that we have looked at a lot and we have a ton of data as to the other groups in Massachusetts, still lots more to be done. As I mentioned, the interesting dynamic of the elongate hemlock scale and the hemlock woolly adulgid occupying different areas or spots on the needles. Um, what is happening there? I would love to know that. So, you know, finding a better way to assess eastern hemlock health will be really important. Uh, Jesse and I and the uh, spatial analysis lab at Smith College, John Karras and, and company, we, we were um, thinking about how to use drones. And you can see in this image here, we had tested launch on campus. Really fun to play with new equipment, right? I love this. So this was, was hopefully we can uh, build on this a little bit because it is so hard to get to the canopy of a tree, right? Unless you have a scaffolding tower, it's gonna be really hard to see what's happening in that canopy. Um, and that can also help us get an eddy covariance tower, which would also help me get uh, that net ecosystem exchange that I was talking about in my framework at the start of the talk and think about more detailed estimates of those source sink dynamics and, and what's happening there. We can also do more uh, below ground and hopefully find a collaborator who can tell us a little bit more about what's happening with the microbial community. That would be great. We can do soil incubation studies in the lab to again, address this issue of what happens to some of those below ground processes if we have uh, warmer winters. So the big question still remains is how will climate change affect this invasion? We are starting to see studies um, demonstrating that overall we'll probably see more invasions or dramatic invasions as a result of a warming climate. Um, in this case here, we know a warmer winters certainly help out the woolly adulgids. And so um, exactly how far, far north and, and west uh, from here will, will they go? So many things uh, to still talk about, and I would love to hear all your questions in, in the chat box. So, also so many people to thank, in particular, Jesse Bellamere. I really do miss our conversations and you know, just hanging out in the office and thinking about how what we can do to uh, further understand the impacts of the ability indulged. Eliza Fassler was a co-author on two of the papers. So how wonderful is that to work with students and have them be co-authors? Um, lots of other students have helped out at various times in different summers. Um, also need to thank um, uh, Bryant Paul Johnson, the graphic designer who I work with and, and does such a wonderful job of kind of visualizing and, and bringing uh, this data and processes um, so it's more accessible to the general public. I do need to thank lots of other people, Harvard Forest, uh, UBC, um, as well as you know, my family members, especially my husband who helped me carry the Lycor 6400 in the field. So thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle. That was a fascinating talk. Great to see the, the work put together in that way. Um, 
we uh, will now watch the uh, the chat box. If if anyone has any comments or questions, I can sort of relay relay those to uh, Danielle and uh, hear more about some of the research she's described tonight. Um, Alice is is asking about earthworms. Um, this is definitely a, a big question in the Northeast where uh, earthworms are not native. Um, and there's concern about both European and Asian earthworms that are invading. Um, and this question was whether or not um, earthworms might be a factor in the rapid uh, loss of leaf litter under the birch forests. That's a, that's a great question. And we've had that question before, but I have not seen them unless, and I, I think, I thought I saw Jenna, Jenna's expert on, on the participation group. And I don't, and when you did the, the work back in the day, did you see earthworms out there? Because I certainly have not in, in when I've done my work. I don't know if Jenna, yeah. it's, it's, no pressure Jenna, but <laughs> Jesse, maybe, Jesse, maybe if I, you remember either. There, there's uh, some earthworms out there. The soils yeah. at the McLeish Field Station are relatively acidic, even underneath the, um, the birch forests. So the earthworms are not very abundant out there. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, potentially a, f a factor, but we don't, I don't think we've seen any evidence of big changes yeah. or, or shifts in abundance of, of earthworms there. Um, but definitely something to watch for, especially with some of these new invasive earthworms that are uh, spreading the jumping worms and such. Yeah, um, definitely. There's also a question uh, in the chat from uh, Janet. Um, asking about the sort of the status of woolly adelgid in the Pacific Northwest on, on Western hemlocks and sort of what is the, the situation there um, with, with adelgids being on, on those forests, but maybe not impacting them as much? Yeah, um, so, and I haven't done any estimates yet, having arrived in June or uh, July, um, but they are definitely here. And, and as I mentioned, or maybe alluded to early on that we have um, such a, a huge area of of Western hemlocks that are here. And of course, um, the woolly adelgids are here in, in pretty high abundance. And as I mentioned, the natural predators are here in high abundance as well, and, and therefore um, might, be, might be good to use in, in the Northeastern United States. What we find here, um, or so far what others have found is that the Western hemlocks have, have one good host resistance so we don't have the same issue of, um, I guess, the hemlock woolly adelgid impacts. It's not the same. So in, on one hand, and that's because of host resistance and also because we have so much, um, uh, such high abundance of those natural predators keeping those numbers down a bit. So even though they are present, the, the impact is relatively minor, especially as we compare it to Eastern hemlocks. There are others though, and I'm forgetting it's a looper, that is, I've also been reading about having impacts in Western hemlocks here as well. Um, so, but overall, there does not seem to be nearly much of a loss in, in the Western hemlocks. All right. And then we've got a question here from uh, Jenna, one of, uh, uh, who worked at the McLeish Field Station years ago. Hi, Jenna. Um, <laughs> Is wondering about the the land use history of the uh, the hemlock forests, the uh, and the mature black forests, um, and sort of what what those areas might have been um, used for before the forest established um, in the early twentieth century. Um, and she's asking whether there might be um, some expectation of a difference in the trajectory of the young black birch forests that are establishing in this hemlock matrix as opposed to those mature black forests that probably grew up on abandoned pastures without this intervening stage of having hemlocks and how that, the, the sort of the, what is that might be the legacy of hemlocks on those soils and, and sort of the rate of transition you might expect there. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting if I understand the question right. And if we, if we look at, the I guess associates in nearby in, in the hemlock stands as as you know there's there's not much of an understory in the eastern in the eastern hemlock stands and of course it is fairly typical the black birch comes in there's uh you know, I guess in some other areas you might expect is it red oak that that might also come into the area so that is another possibility if and I don't I didn't have enough uh, good pictures of the mature birch stand. 
But even if you look in, in and walk through the mature birch sands at McLeish, there isn't a lot of an understory there either. Um, and, and so yet we see these dramatic differences, um, you know, in the different communities of the macrofungal communities that we can see. So yeah, I guess the, and this is a, this is a fascinating question. If I understand it right, I'm thinking about, well, you know, okay, what could happen and how this, how does this transition and uh, given even the logging of the, the, who knows why the forest manager logged uh, those plots in Eastern, in the Eastern Hemlock area. Um, 30 plus years ago. Um, I, in, in this case, um, yeah, pretty, I don't have a good answer for what, what could be next or how might that be different? Because at least in this area, it's pretty, or that area, Massachusetts and Connecticut, the other areas in Massachusetts uh, that Harvard Forest has looked at, it's a pretty, pretty standard transition that we're seeing. Great. Um, so one one question, sort of connecting this study system with the Eastern Hemlocks to where you're setting up shop in in the Pacific Northwest now. Um, I'm wondering. I haven't spent a lot of time out there, but whether the the Western Hemlock is considered a foundation species there, or whether it's just one of many conifers in those forests, or do you see areas that have dense Western hemlock in the same way that, you know, uh, Eastern hemlock can form these large, almost like monoculture type stands here. Yeah, and it, it's it's really neat. And I haven't uh, been able to explore as much as I'd like to, and I can't wait. Um, I don't know if you can hear, it was just thundering here a minute ago. So we're in the middle of the, the uh, <laughs> we just started the uh, rainy season and winter rainy season. But that is actually kind of ties into well, we see Western hemlocks dominating, you know, the coastal areas. And so what's really neat about this area is that we have basically like temperature rainforests, right? It's so neat. It's so different from what we see in the Northeastern United States, right? And so they are very dominant in those areas. You can have, in a sense, homogeneous um, uh, forest stands, of course, and, you know, they get much bigger and also clearly would still have a similar kind of impact on the microenvironment in terms of shade and cooler temperatures. But we also do see some um, unique mixtures that maybe we don't see quite as much in the Northeastern United States of you know, hemlock and maybe even other hemlock species as well as Douglas fir and things mm -hmm. like that. So there, uh, yeah, so I can't wait to explore that as you know, going from more coastal areas and more interior to see like what kind of cool mixtures that we have there. But they are definitely um, homogeneous stands that are pretty dominant, uh, yeah. Western hemlock. Great. All right, let me see. Any other questions people can pop into the, the chat here? Um, I guess um, one, uh, one question for Danielle is, uh, I'm curious to know if you're planning to continue collaborating with the folks at Harvard Forest and, and getting back to the, the Northeast in the next few years. Definitely. So, um, and you and I have talked about, oh, we should really um, talk to Dave, Dave Orwig at uh, Harvard Forest. And every time we kind of, our paths cross, even within the Harvard Forest group, um, we think, oh, we really need to start working on this <laughs> together. And, and so I definitely want to do that. And that's something we should definitely think about and continue talking about for the 2022 field season, I will definitely be back. Um, and one reason is that I miss everybody. <laughs> and two is that um, that uh, I do have some other projects at Harvard Forest. And I, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, or that you mentioned as well in the introduction that I'm working with indigenous communities, Harvard Forest is located on Nipmuc land. So that is really just started in terms of how we think about building a relationship and to even think about co-producing and collaborating on projects. And so I will definitely be back every year, probably multiple times a year. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm excited and to continue this work uh, for sure. And also I, and I didn't, and I definitely want to include Western Hemlock uh, information here and, and start doing kind of a cross-continental comparison um, as we see Eastern Hemlocks being impacted by Willie Adelgid. So definitely expanding Aduna. Uh, coast to coast uh, uh, comparison, as well as adding some sites in between, like in the Midwest. Great. 
Um, so actually following on one of the points that you were just noting, uh, Karen posted in the chat, um, she was seeing some of your uh, work online and, and the hope of incorporating indigenous perspectives into your research going forward. Um, and wondering about sort of what sort of what you imagine or you're starting to think about as the, those perspectives and how that might influence research or the interpretation of research. Um, sort of where does that intersect with the science? Um, so I think we'd be curious to hear about that. Yeah, and and here it's I mean, if you do a quick Google search on logging of old growth forests in BC, you'll see so many articles about it, and and it's complicated, right? I, I think if we think about some First Nations uh, communities that might th be thinking more in mind of being economically sound for their community and if they're doing logging or not and as well as the forestry industry also doing logging that are not First Nations groups. It's very complicated in, in I guess the goals and the reasons why for doing that. And of course, I think as we approach now in thinking a lot of what we can do to help mitigate climate change or adapt to climate change, part of it that we hear quite a bit are planting uh, trees. Is that enough to kind of mm -hmm. you know, adapt or, or you know, deal with that? And that isn't just um, isolated to indigenous communities, but if we think about urban areas, right? And, and there's, oh gosh, it's a huge area thing of this to talk about. But um, so it, it, it certainly adds now that societal component and this, you know, the communities. And so in, when, we, when I mentioned about First Nations here and that they do have, you know, those in more in the, in the interior and, and not in the urban setting, like I am, um, yeah, that that is a huge issue if you lose out on these forests and lose out on culturally important species. Um, in addition to losing out on you know ecosystem services like storing carbon, um, yeah, that, that that's devastating. And so uh, there's definitely a goal to work together, and especially if um, if I am or anyone is. Um, I guess, uh, trying to collaborate with indigenous communities or First Nations that if you're on their land and even collecting something as simple as soil respiration or looking, digging up the soil, looking at that soil organically uh, and thinking about whose land you're on and what happens with that data and having a very transparent dialogue about, uh, I guess, data analysis as well as interpretation of the data. But this is a huge, such a huge topic. So if, if we're, uh, yeah, so when we're in meet, in the meet and greet, uh, we can still talk about it further if anyone would like to. Yeah, great. Um, and we have a, a question from uh, Daniel uh, here um, asking about the, the fairly strong effects that you were detecting in changes in soil respiration and potential carbon storage in this uh, hemlock deciduous forest system, uh, sort of these mixed forests. Um, and he's asking about uh, what might happen a bit further north, like in the White Mountains, where where hemlock is, uh, you know, co-occurring with or co-dominant with spruce, uh, another conifer. Um, in I guess maybe sort of implying, would you expect such dramatic changes if you're seeing a system where there is another evergreen conifer in the forest as well that might take advantage of the decline of hemlock? Would you see such a dramatic change, maybe? That's a great question, and this kind of ties in with some other research and something that we alluded to in our Ecosphere 2018 paper, which is, and I'll first talk about uh, black birch. So, in that, um, in that, on some level, it, we were we could hypothesize, and others have used models to look at, which is, well, might you have in this case a switch if it's to black birch. Um, more carbon accumulation that, that would happen really fast and, and kind of make up for the carbon that's lost in the soil. And, and of course, there might be some small range of small, in this case, a few decades in, in which that could be the case. But if you look at our data and, and do the comparison of above ground biomass, it was pretty similar in our mm -hmm. system looking at the mature birch stands versus the hemlock. So the similar age, similar above ground, at least comparable above ground biomass. So the answer really, I think, lies in looking at that, the above ground biomass, but also need to look at that soil. So I think 
I think easily if, I guess the simple answer to that would be to go dig up the soil in the spots and see what the soil organic, you know, grams per meter squared values are. And if you have that estimate above ground biomass, then you could make the comparison here and get the answer, pretty straightforward answer of, of that. Um, yeah, we should do that. <laughs> Uh, and there's a, a question here from from Janet about um, sort of the the role of black birch in these forests in the Northeast and whether um, it is sort of it seems to be sort of an early successional species. Um, and so she's so noting she doesn't think of it as sort of a long term dominant in the same way that hemlock can just self perpetuate on sites for you know centuries. Um, what so what might this mean for the future of the forest in the the northeast um uh, let me see particularly in those cooler microclimates so if if the black birch is maybe sort of a temporary phenomena what you know what might be the future of these forests if you if you're missing this this hemlock component yeah and that's something it's hard to answer only because uh, right it's it's that even in our system in in the paired plots, I mean, we kind of have this, um, I guess, interesting mixture of and like no differences because there was such an overlapping impact of the leaf litter and things like that. Um, and maybe, and also just wasn't long enough to see a depletion of that. Um, but they were still fairly homogeneous, really, if you look at the species. I mean, you might, might have had one or two others, but um, you know, the black birch was pretty dominant in those that were 30 plus years old. And then, it, and as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the mature birch stands, again, pretty dominant um, mm. uh, overall. So I don't know how long it would take, right? Um, and, and I don't have a good example of, and I, I think it's pretty widely uh, unknown um, exactly what, what's going to happen with that. Because if we look at our fairly homogeneous mature birch stands, or at least really dominant mature birch stands that are 85 to 100 years old, um, there doesn't seem to be any kind, of, at least in my opinion, does being there and uh, any any change or shift that's going to happen anytime soon. So um, it'll be neat to see how this plays out over the next few decades, but I think overall there isn't quite a known um, uh, I guess what's it going to be in a decade yeah. or two, right? No, I, th I think that's a good observation. I would just add um, the those more homogenous birch stands. Um, they're sort of a we see them in response to land use history that you know traces back maybe 150 years or so in the Northeast. So there's lots of black birch stands tracing to old fields, and then there's these black birch stands emerging in hemlock forests. Um, but we, I guess we, there's not, we don't have great examples of black birch dominated forests that are old growth or something. We do see some black birch and old growth, but we just don't have the time scale yet to, to assess what sort of what happens to a, a black birch dominated forest after 300 years. Um, so it's, it is tricky. Yeah. Um, let me see, uh, Nancy uh, posted here, um, she was on a Forest History Society field trip um, in Menominee County, Wisconsin, um, to see white pines, uh, and sort of incredible to see what an old growth forest dominated by white pine would look like. Um, and wondering if you have you've done any research in uh, Wisconsin um, in some of those uh, the areas where you grew up and and where your family's from, um, the uh, particularly the, these old growth forests dominated by these massive white pines that are so striking in that in that region. I, I would love to get back and, and do that, as I mentioned, uh, hopefully adding some Midwestern sites as of now. I think there's early talk of adding uh, some Michigan sites to um, uh, the overall data set. Um, and I would I would love to get back. I think I think it's a matter of how many sites I can get to in a summer and um, how it hopefully co find collaborators in each of these states that uh, could help alleviate that uh, issue for me. And, um, but that would be really neat. I would love to get back and, and do that. And I just wanted to um, again, thank um, Danielle for, for joining us tonight, uh, cross continent um, <laughs> from, from Vancouver. Um, it was really great to see this, this summary of the work that's been done um in 
in the Northeast here and think about some of the connections in, in your new home base in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Janet says it, you know, great research, great talk, um, and look, look forward to hearing more of your work in the future. Um, I think that's probably a sentiment that a lot of, a lot of folks uh, have after hearing this, the talk tonight. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for the invitation.